Okay, well, good morning, everybody. So uh, we're right at 10 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, I see we have uh, 60 people with us so far, and we are expecting some more to join us, so that number will probably increase as we go. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today uh, and for your interest in learning more about invasive species, specifically invasive vines, which Dan Berenger is going to be talking about with us today. Um, so I just want to take a moment, introduce myself, um, and also introduce Dan. Uh, so my name is Amy Jewett, and I am with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program, and I serve as the Invasive Species Coordinator. Uh, I'm based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but today I am joining you uh, from my home office here in Valencia, Pennsylvania, which is located in the southern part of uh, Butler County. So my role at the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy is to manage uh, a program called IMAP Invasives, which is an online tool that we use to document the occurrences of um, invasive species in Pennsylvania, along with management efforts, um, and have been in this role uh, for almost 10 years. Uh, so we currently have over 2,000 users of the program, um, and it's been in existence now since about 2013. Um, I do want to mention, um, before I introduce Dan, we do have a Q&A as well as chat that folks can use to ask questions throughout uh, the presentation. And then we will also have time at the end um, to moderate and, and ask uh, questions, answer some questions as well. Um, so now I want to take a moment and just introduce our guest speaker today, Dan Berenger. Uh, Dan is the Invasives Management Coordinator for Natural Lands, uh, which is a conservation-based organization that's located in Media, Pennsylvania, which is in southeastern, um, so the southeastern part of the state. Uh, Dan has uh, 30 years of land management experience with natural lands and currently manages the 712-acre Crow's Nest Preserve that's located near Elverson, Pennsylvania. Uh, Dan entered the field of natural areas management through the field of horticulture. He holds a BA in English from Haverford College. He completed an internship at Morris Arboretum of the University of Pennsylvania and continued his horticultural training at Longwood Gardens. Dan is a master urban gardener, certified pesticide applicator, and firing boss for prescribed fire. He also recently became an FAA certified small unmanned aerial systems pilot. Dan gives lectures to garden clubs and environmental groups about the impacts and management of invasive plants and has been a speaker and moderator at the conferences of the Mid-Atlantic Invasive Plant Council. He has also spoken on topics including prescribed grazing for habitat management and the use of a smartphone GPS to monitor conservation easements. So welcome, Dan, and go ahead and take it away. You're still on mute, Dan. OK, there you go. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you for having me, Amy, and thank you all for joining me today. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. I'm speaking to you from southeastern Pennsylvania, which is also the lands of the Lenny Lenape. Um, and I bring this up for a couple of reasons related to stewardship that's specific to the topic today. Um, one of the things I've learned is that when Europeans stepped off the boat, they thought they were stepping into a wilderness when in fact they were stepping into a managed landscape, one that had been managed for more than 10,000 years. And so there are implications for that in how we manage our land today. We've long been saying that land that is unmanaged is not fully protected. And so uh, we have that to learn. And many of the same techniques that indigenous peoples used apply today, things like prescribed fire and prescribed grazing. So uh, I wanted to acknowledge that their history and presence on the land and their continu continuing pr presence. Natural Lands does three things. We save open space, either by uh, holding conservation easements on private property or by owning our own preserves. We also take care of those preserves. That's the stewardship aspect of which I'll be speaking today. 
And we also connect people to the outdoors by holding programs on our preserves and being open to the public every day. But today we're gonna to talk about a particular management issue that is vines. Uh, and I think you're here probably because you have some related problems or issues uh, with that. So, uh, but I wanna step back and say, it's not enough to say, it, I wanna get rid of all vines. You really need to think in terms of a positive outcome. What do you want the landscape to look like? It's not what do you want to get rid of, but what what is the positive goal? I think that's better for the landscape and for your mental health. But we know that invasive vines can have an impact on the landscape and, and compete with our objectives for the land. Um, they can simply outcompete the trees and shrubs for sunlight. They can halt the process of succession from field to forest. They raise the center of gravity of trees uh, and make them more susceptible to being blown over. And they alter community relationships and not just the ones that you may be thinking, the trophic ones about what resources of, are available to wildlife, but they can impact uh, things that you can't see going on in the soil, the chemical and fungal relationships going on underground. And when we talk about invasives, we need to talk about uh, our legacy. Um, what, what is special about the place in which we live especially if we're growing all the same set of invasive plants as every other community in the country. Um, this is a, a, a lot that is covered with uh, five-leaf akebia um, with a sign for a development of bittersweet way. So I think you know we need to be able to share with our kids and grandkids what is special and unique about the flora in which we live. And some of these invasive plants can inhibit that, our ability to do that. That said, I don't want to demonize any of these plants um, and that also there are many native non-invasive vines. So we're only going to speak today about five species, uh, actually six, I snuck in two in, in one genus, pale and black swallowwort, Asiatic bittersweet, hardy kiwi vine, kudzu, and five-leaf akebia. Uh, these are the Latin names for each of those. Um, and they also come from five different families, from dogbane to the pea family. Four of the five, the ones with stars next to them, are already are on the noxious weed list in Pennsylvania. And one of those was just added, the five-leaf akebia. And the remaining one, um, actually any of these may be an opportunity for early detection rapid response for you if it's not already present. But particularly for us, hardy kiwi is not thought to be in this area uh, too much yet. And so you should be keeping an eye out for it so that you can act on it when it does arrive. In the process of doing the research for this talk, I found out that there's a nursery, a, uh, a, an orchard near us about 10 miles away that is growing hardy kiwi vine and selling the fruit to their customers. Um, so it is actually already in my neighborhood and I didn't know it. I heard recently on a podcast uh, called um, by the seed of our plants, uh, that every plant offers a gift. So again, I don't wanna demonize any of these species. The right species in the right place has its place, um, but we are gonna speak specifically about these five um, species. Pale swallowwort is one which I didn't know I had here on the preserve until I took a class at Conway School of Landscape Design about 20 years ago. Uh, on invasive plants. And they covered this one. And I thought, well, I'm lucky I don't have that one. And I came home now knowing what it looked like and realized I did have this one. Uh, so this picture shows a lot about the habit and identification. It is strongly opposite leaved, very small maroon flowers, very narrow leaves, very short petiole. Those are all characteristic and somewhat of a blue green leaf color. And this used to be in the genus Vincitoxicum. And if that name gives you any thought uh, about that it's poisonous, yes, it is. This is a close-up of the flowers, sort of a, a maroon flower, very pretty. This only grows one to two meters. I've never personally seen it grow more than a meter tall, um, but the literature does say two meters. Um, so it's not going to climb up your trees and outcompete them for sunlight. Uh, what it is going to do is grow so densely on the ground that in some places, mostly to the north of us, New England and Canada, they call it the dog swallowing vine or the dog strangling vine. It grows very thick. This is the related species, black swallowwort. 
that has shorter petals and darker petals and slightly more hairy uh, petals. Uh, this was used to be called Vincitoxicum nigrum, but otherwise very similar in growth and habit and, and behavior. And it is in the dogbane plant family. And so it does form these seed pods that will blow, the seeds will blow in the wind. So when you're pulling this, you will not get the roots out. It always breaks off at the crown. Uh, and yet we sometimes will still pull it knowing that we're not getting the whole plant just to keep the seed, the plant from going to seed. And that's one of the ways we've been able to keep it from spreading. Some of the impacts of swallowwort is simply that it forms a dense monoculture. It is poisonous, although I don't want to get too hung up on that. Plenty of plants are, are poisonous. What's more important to me is that it may attract monarchs, but is not a viable food source for its larva. So it could become a wildlife sink. There are a couple species that look somewhat similar. There is a native swallowwort, Metellia caroliniensis, um, Carolina milk vine. The flowers looks like somewhere in between the two. It's got the strap-like uh, petals but it's darker like, like Sinantrum nigrum. Um, but the leaves don't look anything like, they're heart-shaped, they're much broader. And so I think that one would be easy to distinguish from the invasive swallow warts. And at the preserve where I work, um, it, our swallow wart is growing among the dogbane and milkweeds, which look superficially similar. And so, um, you do need to look at each individual plant and say, yes, that's a narrow leaf. It's kind of blue green. Um, that has a much smaller flower than the milkweeds. Um, and, and so it is easy to distinguish between the two. Uh, or uh, Asiatic bittersweet is a, one that historically has been a terrible problem for us with vines in the same diameter as your leg, uh, growing up trees and out competing them for sunlight. Uh, there's a close-up of the flowers and the fruit. And that is one of the ways it gets spread around. Uh, birds eat that fruit, and also it's used in dried flower arrangements. And, uh, and so that does get it out into the landscape in places where it might otherwise not be. I, if I'm talking about um, Celastris, I should also mention spotted lanternfly. If you live in a part of the country where that is already present, uh, this is one of the preferred hosts for the early instars of that insect. That and multiflora rose and our native black walnut and our Virginia creeper tend to attract the early instars of this insect. Um, not enough to slow down the bittersweet, but um, I, I thought you should be aware of that. As far as lookalikes, there is a native bittersweet, um, American bittersweet, Celastris scannans. The main difference is that the Asiatic bittersweet flowers and fruits in the axles of the leaves all the way up the vine. So there's abundant fruit and seed. The native only really flowers at the terminal panicle. And so it produces far fewer seeds and therefore is far less invasive. Another vine that looks a little bit like bittersweet from a distance is the hardy kiwi vine. But if you look up close, it has red petioles and much different flowers and different fruit. It is related to the kiwi of the supermarket. And the picture at the bottom shows you what the differences are. It's a hairless fruit uh, with an edible skin. It's said to be delicious, uh, but it is also very invasive. And it is sold as a kiwi berry. So I've relied a bit on the Berkshire Environmental Action Team because they're the ones who seem to be doing a lot of work with it. Uh, they describe the areas where it invades as forming amphitheaters, where the vines grow up to trees and create walls and then cover the ground inside a room that it creates. Uh, and so here is a shot of a, a location where the vines on the trees have been cut, and yet the vine is very much still alive on the ground. And they have put out a uh, booklet that is very detailed in the description and identification of this plant and the management of this plant. So I definitely recommend that you take a look at that. This vine goes by other names, the Tara vine and the Bowerberry, for example. And in the winter, it looks like this. Uh, and if you see that, you might be reminded of another invasive vine, something like kudzu. 
because that's the sort of the look that we expect to see of kudzu. Now, kudzu is, is found as far north as Connecticut, so it is not just a vine of the south. And here's a close-up of the flowers and the leaves, three-part leaf. As far as lookalikes for kudzu, maybe um, Dutchman's pipe, pipe vine, the, the leaves don't really look like kudzu, but sometimes the habit you might see Aristolochia tomentosa covering a tree, but probably covering just one tree, not every tree. And then as far as the leaves, poison ivy obviously has a three-part leaf as well, but I don't think they look that similar. Uh, and poison ivy does not tend to grow in thick, ropey, uh, drooping vines all the way up in a tree. It usually stays close to the trunk and then branches out laterally from there. Another invasive vine is five leaf akebia. And this one really looks like nothing else in that it is one of few vines that are uh, palmately compound and the leaves are enmarginate. So the tip of the leaf, instead of pointing out like many leaves do, it actually points in, kind of makes a heart shape. And that's very distinctive. In the shade, it tends to have this blue green color and sort of a rubbery texture of leaf. Although it grows fine in full sun where it's more of a golden yellow, and that's one of the problems with it. It grows in full sun, full shade. Uh, it can inhibit a meadow from undergoing succession to forest. And in the forest, it is covering the ground so that there's no regeneration of native trees. And so when the existing trees die, which all trees eventually do, there'll be nothing left but a kibia. This is a close up of the flower. Um, this also goes by the name chocolate vine, uh, I guess, for the burgundy brown color of, of the flowers. And I've never seen it in fruit, but here is what the fruit looks like. And this is what it does on the landscape. And this is at an environmental education center in the Philadelphia region. And I think it would be difficult to teach kids about nature when you're uh, looking at a landscape so heavily impacted by a single species. As far as lookalikes, the only other palmately compound vine I can think of was Virginia creeper, Parthenocystis quinquefolia, but it really doesn't look the same at all. The leaflets are toothed. Um, it just, it doesn't look to me anything like a kibia. So when you're looking at these vines and wanting to manage them, you want to think in terms of early detection because that's where you have the greatest possibility of successful management. The longer you wait, the longer before you recognize that a species is present, the greater the control costs, the less likelihood of success and the larger area infested. Uh, so by the time you know you have a problem, it may be too late. So that's one of the reasons to become familiar with species that are not even yet present in your immediate region. And we'll talk in a minute about a tool that will help you with that. Ideally, when you're managing these landscapes, you would rather have a, a curve that looks like this. Maybe it takes a great deal of effort the first year or two to manage an invasive species, but then you get down to a maintenance level where it just takes a little bit of time each year. Chances are you'll never get to zero, but if you can get down to a low level maintenance uh, amount of work, then that may, that may be success for you. So one of the tools that you can use to track invasive species in your region is IMAP Invasives. And it is available for several states. And if you click on Pennsylvania, you come to the Pennsylvania specific website. And there's a lot of resources on here that teach you how to use the tool and um, various successful uh, programs that have used it. But basically it's a mapping tool. And here I've highlighted uh, Akibia quinata. Uh, and you can see there's a location here in Westchester, Pennsylvania, as well as a few others here closer to the Schuylkill River. And um, so basically it, it's, a, it's a GIS type um, tool that lets you um, record point data as well as many other kinds of data. So if you click on a particular record, you have some thumbnail photographs, you have some notes from the observer uh, and um, these are particularly good photographs here because they use the ruler to show the size of the five-leaf akebia plant. 
and you can upload more than one photograph. So it's good also to, con to capture sort of the place in which it's growing, give you an idea of the habitats. But IMAP invasives is far more than that. Uh, you can do polygons, not just points uh, of location. And you can do polygons that include a null set of data. A polygon, for example, that says, I've searched this area and this invasive species is not present. So that would help uh, you move forward and come to places where it is present. Uh, it can also do project management. You can gather a bunch of these records into a single project so that you can track your control methods and um, see what happens over time. So I think that's a really important tool. There is also a um, handheld version for smartphones and tablets. Um, the IMAP Invasives Classic app uh, just lets you upload a single photo, uh, but the, there is also an option of using ArcGIS Survey 123 to upload multiple photos. And it is helpful to have more than one photograph. Ideally, your pictures have the target in focus, not the background, and that you're close enough that the, the subject is clear. Um, you can include, uh, include a picture from a distance unless, unless it's the only one. The, the distance photos really are just to show you the context. It's great if you can show scale and capture, if there are distinguishing characteristics of the species, try to capture those. And then you can't go wrong with, with more information is better than less information. Each of these photos and records is evaluated and the more information that you can provide to the people doing the evaluation, the better off everyone will be. Now, I said when managing invasive plants, it's not enough to say, I wanna get rid of them all. So you need to have goals for your specific property. Uh, and I put a few samples up here on the screen. Um, for us at Crow's Nest, where I work, we're trying to maintain habitat continuity with the surrounding landscape. We're adjacent to state game lands, state park, and a, a Hopewell Furnace National Historic Site. So we're trying to have that landscape function as a single entity. We will also want to maintain a representative example of Piedmont flora. What, what is typical of this region and people can come see it. And then there are some rare species present on the site and we need to maintain the conditions under which they thrive and invasive vines can inhibit that. So from those goals, we have these objectives. We wanna monitor what we have so that we can do early detection rapid response if the need arises. We want to prevent new invasions, and that means not planting some of these invasive species and landscaping. We want to reduce the impact of the invasions that we have, uh, and then restore as needed, if needed. And then strategies would include things like having an inventory and a map, and IMAP invasives is an ideal place to do that. You need to prioritize your efforts because you can't do it all. Ideally, you only use best management practices. If someone else has already figured out what's work, what works, that's what we should be using. And you can look at this as a kind of integrated pest management for plants, integrated vegetation management, where you establish a threshold of tolerance for a species and then turn to the least toxic methods of managing them that you can. And this is adaptive management. You should be evaluating your actions. And if it's not working, you need to adjust what you're doing. Now, Amy suggested I mention prioritization a little bit more because that question was sure to come up. Um, you will establish the kind of prioritization you want to do. But for us, we're gonna prioritize by ge geographic location. You're actually gonna work from the least impacted places on your way out to the most impacted places because you can actually have the greatest impact with the least amount of work in a place that has, where if you start in a place where there are the fewest invasive plants. You may also need to start in a place that's a high visibility location. You may have other uh, priorities. Um, if a plant is gonna propagate upstream to downstream or uphill from downhill, then it makes sense to start with the upstream or uphill uh, population. You would, prioritized by species. Some of these species will have a greater ecological impact in your particular landscape than others. And so they, they would be high priority. Vines almost always are high priority. And if there's no chance of controlling it, um, for the, us, that would be something like Japanese stiltgrass in our floodplains. Then we're not really gonna spend the resources on that. We may do a great deal of effort on Japanese stiltgrass in our uplands, um, but 
um, we need to be we need to be realistic about what we can and cannot do. And then uh, obviously, if there's a large seed producing individual, that would be a higher priority than a seedling, for example. So I'm gonna talk about three of the five uh, techniques. Um, as far as I know, biological control is only being researched for kudzu at this point. And a cultural control here, I don't mean the anthropological cultural control, although I did earlier mention the indigenous connection. Here, I'm mainly talking about uh, like the cultural management you do in your garden by adding lime and fertilizer. In this case, it would be doing something like prescribed fire, which creates the conditions under which the warm season grasses that you want to grow will thrive and uh, also simultaneously cre creates the conditions under which many of the invasive species do not thrive. But today we're mainly going to focus on the vines and I definitely wanted to put prevention right up front there because that's easy to forget. Um, and then mechanical and chemical co uh, controls in combination. So as far as prevention, uh, I call this the Hippocratic Oath of Land Management. First, do no harm. And that means not planting invasive species, um, not driving through a wet field and changing the hydrology of a site, making sure your equipment and vehicles are clean so that you're not inadvertently spreading some of these weed seeds. Now, many of our native species and some of our rare species are highly adapted to disturbance. So I'm not saying avoid all disturbance, I'm saying avoid unplanned disturbance. Um, prescribed fire itself is a disturbance and you may employ that for a specific objective. What you don't wanna do is cause something by accident, unplanned. So a lot of the mechanical control, we use the, the labor of volunteers and ourselves, um, but I'm really not here talking about ripping things out, roots and all. There may be a place for that small, small vines and small numbers, but we have found over the years that ripping things out, roots and all, wholesale, tractor and chain, front end loader, whatever, um, just creates the conditions. It brings more weed seed to the surface and either you get another invasive species in its place like you rip out all the vines and you get Japanese stilkgrass or garlic mustard, and then you're on the invasives treadmill, or um, you'll get more of the same. You know, if you're pulling out uh, bittersweet, you may just get more bittersweet seedlings because that soil disturbance really creates the conditions under which some of these plants thrive. So we're really more talking about cutting, mechanical cutting, cutting as high as you can reach and then as low as you can reach. And for that, the ideal is a tool like what is shown on left and right here, and, and that is, uh, it's a brush cutter with interchangeable shafts. So on the left, a brush knife is ideal for smaller diameter vines and canes. And on the right, a chainsaw tip, which can take anything up to 12 or 13 inches in diameter. And I hope you don't have to come across that. I, the, the great thing about this tool is that um, they're normally, they, historically they've been gasoline powered, but now they are available in a ba battery powered uh, head unit and the, the tools themselves, the tips are interchangeable between the two. So we still have our gasoline powered ones, but we've also now started trying out electric ones. And I have to say the staff seems to prefer the electric one. It's quieter, uh, it's cleaner burning, and uh, it seems to be the one that people pick up and use. But if you're only doing mechanical cutting, the, the roots will respond with vigorous regrowth. and so. Unless you're able to cut constantly and exhaust those root reserves, you are going to get the vines coming back up into the canopy. Um, and so you're probably going to want to combine that mechanical cutting with another technique, such as herbicide. And so I've used a blue heading on this slide because these are water soluble uh, herbicides that we're covering on these next couple pages. And they come in two kinds. Selective would be broadleaf specific herbicides. And then there's non-selective herbicides, ones that will kill anything that they touch. Uh, all of these uh, are systemic. They translocate to the roots of the plant. So we'll start with the selective ones, and that would include uh, ones with the active ingredient triclopyr, and that's available in two different forms, well, multiple forms of which two we cover here. And one of them is triclopyr amine, which is sold as Garlon 3A. That carries a signal word of danger, uh, and then triclopyr choline, which is now sold as Vaslan, which carries a warning one. The warning is a little bit uh, 
more comforting than danger to me. And so I've actually stopped using Garlon 3A and switched over to Vastlan. Uh, Garlon 3A has the danger label because the undiluted uh, chemical pr presents a threat to your eyes. Uh, so the person mixing it primarily. Um, and so uh, why not use the one that is a little safer for the operator? So when you apply this, you're going to follow the label. Uh, you're going to mix it with water and a non-ionic non surfactant. And the key is the rate should be what is what will control the weed at the rate per acre. Um, and so you need to calculate the area being treated, and you can do that in IMAP invasives. Um, both of these are labeled for wetland use. Um, and you can also be sort of mechanically selective of what you apply it to. Uh, although that's a little bit more difficult with foliar sprays than it is with cut stump or basil bark, which I'll cover shortly. Uh, but you, you're you basically using a backpack spray or something handheld to apply it just where you need it. And uh, both of these, the labels do include mixing, the op option of mixing it with other herbicides. So I advise you to look to the labels for specific instructions on that. Typical mixes for this are going to be a 0.5 to 1.5% solution plus a surfactant, as long as you don't exceed the legal rate of active ingredient acid equivalent per acre. So you have to see the label for that. As far as non-selective chemistry, for that you're basically looking at glyphosate and that has a signal word of caution. So that's even better yet. Um, again, you're gonna follow the label and it is available. Some of the formulations are approved for use in wetlands. Uh, and you mix it again with water and a non-ionic surfactant but it will kill whatever you spray it on. So it's, it's, not as, it's not chemically selective. Now, there is another mix that I've never personally used. So I'm gonna uh, rely on people who have. Our intern here has, and she brought me up to speed with this. And also Art Gover from Penn State has put together a, um, a webpage on that. So I'd advise you to check this webpage out to learn uh, more about the mix of glyphosate and triclopyr. They seem to be uh, to work well together as long as you mix it under a very specific procedure. Um, they can't mix until they're already diluted, basically, or else a precipitate forms. Uh, so there's very specific ways in which you would mix this. But that makes it a little bit more um, successful at uh, controlling weeds. And that is important because labor is your largest cost when you're doing invasive management. And if you can make a particular spray activity more successful, then, um, then that's really gonna save, save you money in the long run. Uh, I should note that Art Gover will be uh, doing this uh, webinar on November 17th at 10 a.m. So if you have questions about this particular uh, technique, he will, be, uh, doing, uh, he will be here to answer those questions. I am gonna talk a little bit about cut stump herbicide and basal bark herbicide, even though basal bark herbicide might not be a good choice for vines growing close to a tree. But let me, let me talk about them a little bit. A cut stump herbicide allows you to use far less volume of liquid per plant, but at a much higher concentration. Instead of you know, half a percent or up to 2%, you may be looking at 50 to 100%, uh, depending on what the label says. And that may mean that uh, you end up using too much per acre. You can quickly go off label if you're using something at high concentration on a lot of stems. So you'd have to be careful about that. Do the math ahead of time. These can be either water or oil-based um, and that they are more mechanically selective because you're really only applying the herbicide to the individual stem that you want to treat. For it to work, it must contact the living tissue of the cambium, and therefore it has to be done on a fresh cut if it's a water-based chemical. The oil-based ones will penetrate bark, and um, you don't even need to cut the stem in that case. Uh, but you also need to be very careful because these vines, particularly these species, are usually supported by desirable trees, and you don't want to be using uh, herbicide too close to the base of those trees. Now, a water-based one is not going to penetrate the bark or the roots of the tree. Where you might be, need to be even more cautious is with a basal bark herbicide, something like uh, Garlon 4, a triclopyr ester, because that will penetrate the bark of adjacent trees. It also is more volatile. 
and can uh, become more airborne, particularly if there's an inversion overnight. And that chemical in the air can even crinkle the leaves of adjacent trees. So it tends to be something people use more in the winter. And again, it does allow you to use a very small volume per plant. Um, and it allows you to be very selective in what you treat. But I would not use this right adjacent to a desirable tree that you want to keep because it's just too much risk that the, the chemical would penetrate the bark. These basal bark herbicides are more ideal, I think, if I'm managing something like multiflora rose or autumn olive in a meadow. Instead of spraying the foliage of the entire plant, I can just reach under and spray the, the crown, the base, up to a few inches. And that seems to work really well. For vines, this may not be the right tool. So here's a summary of the chemicals that we covered. This is a, a chart based on Art Gover's one online. Um, and the, the pounds of active ingredient acid equivalent per gallon just shows you that these are roughly comparable to one another. Um, some of these are selective. Glyphosate obviously is not. Um, a few of these have an aquatic label. The oil-based one, triclopyr ester, does not. And that is, it is really only for basal bark. It can be mixed with water and make a foliar spray, but again, it is more volatile than any of the other choices. And so you have these other tools uh, available. So I would probably choose one that's less vol volatile. So probably for us, um, most of what we do is either Vaseline or Rodeo. Um, although these are uh, glyphosate in particular is available in many different formulations. So I know people do spray uh, 30 feet up a tree with a foliar spray. If you have the equipment and you're gonna do that, that is possible. But for most of us, we're going out with a backpack sprayer and treating the, what we can reach. And we're also probably not gonna be spraying basil bark oil near the desirable tr trees. Uh, and so what we're probably gonna be doing 90% of the time is combining a mechanical cutting with a foliar sp spray of what resprouts and repeating as necessary. You, you could go in first and do a little spraying to sort of clear an area out enough to uh, get to the vines and then you go in and cut the vines and then you treat again later. Um, chances are that's, that's what work, seems to work the best for us. But remember the desired future condition. Uh, you need to pay attention to um, what is the objective here. And the most successful projects I've seen is where editing out some of the invasive plants allowed the native species to sort of step in and thrive, and then the community becomes self-sustaining. I've seen other projects that didn't work as well, but ideally you're just editing out the parts you don't want, and then the rest fills in. So I'm happy to uh, answer questions here today, and also you're welcome to contact me by email, um, and uh, I think we'll wrap up there. So I will... Stop sharing if I can. Okay, thanks, Dan. Actually, if you don't mind keeping up your contact information, that slide, maybe folks want to um, jot that down. So keeping that up could be helpful. Um, yeah, so thanks, Dan. That was awesome. Really uh, good stuff. Um, and now if folks want to ask any questions, we do have the chat and Q&A available. So if folks want to ask a question, I will um, help to moderate that. And then Dan, you can, you can answer things as they come in. Um, so we do have a question. Can you mention uh, Japanese hops? Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about Japanese hops? Okay, we do have a little bit of that here on the preserve. And actually we, we got more when we brought some fill soil in from another preserve to fill in uh, a, a building site that we, where we took the building down, we need to grade out the area. And we had a little bit. So that's actually one where a broadleaf herbicide, something like Vaslan would be ideal uh, because that would have the least amount of impact on the surrounding plants. Um, it is gonna kill any broadleaf plant that it touches. So you would still apply it selectively, but it will not affect the grasses on the site. And so we did a little spot spraying with a broadleaf herbicide and that really slowed it down. Um, you could combine that with brush cutting if you wanted. Uh, to limit the amount of herbicide that you needed to spray. Uh, so I think in combination, those two things would work pretty well. Okay, very good, thank you. 
We have another question. Um, are any of your featured invasives being investigated for biological control? As far as I know, only kudzu. And that, that's the one that seems to have the greatest uh, economic impact, particularly for the communities in the South where it has been so aggressive. Um, but as far as I know, that's the only one. Okay, very good. We have a question, uh, is cutting and applying triclopyr the best approach for porcelain berry? So porcelain berry, we have that at one of our other preserves. Uh, so I have a little bit of experience. And of course it looks a lot like grapevine but is more finely divided leaves, more um, sort of deep, more deeply lobed typically. And the pith is a little different. Um, with that one, I would combine a brush cutting and then probably follow it with a foliar spray as well. I mean, if it's a relatively small number of plants, you could cut and paint individual stems. But if it's a lot, and it's, that's the nature of the beast, um, I would probably just brush cut it off of as much of the surrounding vegetation and then spray what's along the ground to try, try to control that. Okay, very good. Um, and another person had some questions just in general about um, porcelain berry. Did you have any other thoughts or considerations specifically for porcelain berry? I like to say the name Empelopsis brevipedunculata. That really rolls <laughs> off the tongue. Um, it is a it is beautiful plant, but it is also very, very invasive. And we do have it in Berks County, Pennsylvania, uh, quite, a, quite a bit. Um, yeah, a lot of the same technique applies to the, the, the same vines. Um, just a, a combination of mechanical cutting combined with uh, a spot spraying. Okay, very good. Um, so another question came in, uh, this person said, I've had a ton of trouble with cucumber vines along riparian buffers, any advice there? And he said, thank you also for your presentation. So that's an annual, um, I believe. And so, management of that might include just trying to prevent it from setting seed. Uh, and so brush cutting might be enough. Uh, and if it's in a riparian area, maybe that's what you choose to do. But it should also be very susceptible to herbicide. So if you were to combine the brush cutting with herbicide, I think that would work pretty well. Okay, very good. Um, and we had another question, um, Dan, if you could just repeat, I believe you, you said this already, but it'd be good for this person to just hear it again. Regarding porcelain berry, what would be the ideal herbicide, glyphosate or glyphosate with triclopyr? I don't have personal experience using the combined glyphosate plus triclopyr, but it is reputed to have um, a broader uh, range of control and is supposed to be very effective. Um, so I'm... I'm pretty confident that that would work, but probably either one alone would also work. Um, and I would probably go with the broadleaf specific herbicide, something like a Vaslan, a, a triclopyr um, choline, and um, try that out uh, because that I think in combination with cutting to limit the amount that you need to spray, because obviously if it's, if it's growing over a desirable shrub or tree, you don't wanna kill the tree or shrub that's growing on. So you're gonna brush cut the bases of it to get that part to die and then just spray what's down low um, on the ground and, and around that desirable tree or shrub. Okay, thank you. Um, another person commented that they saw their first burr cucumber this year and should they be worried about that? So I think burr cucumber is actually a native species and I think that's also an annual. and um, so you, you, when you see it, you could be alarmed because it sort of it is pretty aggressive. Um, but I've never really um, found it so aggressive that I needed to control it. Okay, very good. Uh, another person was asking about kudzu. Do you need to bag and remove vines if hand pulling? And if you choose to spray, do you let dead vines lay on the ground? or bag and remove to get rid of the seeds? That's a good question. So I have no personal experience managing kudzu itself. We have, have had it on one of our preserves and it was controlled there using a broadleaf uh, herbicide. Um, if you're pulling it, will it reroot? I'm not absolutely sure. Lots of things do, norway maple, um, garlic mustard, they're, they're all infamous for rerooting. And so I, I would bet that this might reroot. So I would either make sure that the roots are not in contact with the ground or that they are bagged up 
Um, and then as far as ones that have been killed by spraying, um, they probably do not need to be bagged up and I suppose they can be left on site. I should probably note that at no point are we ever really pulling any of these vines out of the trees. They, whatever's cut and is dead up in the canopy stays in the canopy. Um, I mean, it'll fall down on its own over time, but it's already dead. It's the, it's the roots, it's the base that, that is the focus of all our subsequent treatment. Okay, very good. Uh, another question came in asking about native bittersweet and is it rare? I have never seen it and I have read that it has hybridized with the more vigorous Asian bittersweet. Yes, I've heard the same thing. I have actually never seen it myself in the wild. Um, and I have also heard that, yes, and one of the reasons it's threatened is because it hybridizes with the non-native and that swamps the genetics. And so there's probably little of or less of the uh, native species still in existence. Okay, thank you. Uh, we had a question from Joseph. Uh, how much running time do you get out of the electric combi tools? Good question. So uh, a few different batteries are available. We um, spent a little extra money to get one that would behave comparable to a gasoline powered tool because I thought that would give us the most chance of success of adopting this technology. And um, we're getting uh, about the same runtime off of battery as we would off of a tank of gas, by which point you wanna break yourself anyway. Um, and we bought multiple batteries so you can just swap a new one in. Um, the batteries are heavy. We, we carry them on a belt or in a backpack. Um, there are other options available, uh, but because the battery is separate from the tool, in this case, it allows the tool itself to be quite light. And uh, it's fairly comfortable to carry the battery on a belt or can even be on a shoulder harness or in a bag. Uh, and so um, we think it's, it's comparable to a, a light duty string trimmer or medium duty string trimmer and has been remarkably effective for us. Okay, wonderful. Uh, we do have a lot more questions, Dan. So a lot okay. of people are very curious sure. about a lot of things here. Um, so we had another question saying, we are a few volunteers trying to clear a small park. How can I share this information? Well, I assume this, this talk is being recorded and mm -hmm. I don't yep. know whether you'll also share it as a PDF file or... Um, Yep. Yep. So I can definitely, I'm going to be sharing out the recording and PDF. Um, I mean, is, I'm wondering, is there um, other resources out there that you would recommend that folks can look at as well, like specific to some of the species that we covered that you would, that come to mind for you? Um, well, the National Park Service is just re-releasing -re 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 a book on invasive plants of the mid-Atlantic. And so that's a good source. Um, if you Google some of these species, you'll come upon nurseries promoting them as much as you'll come upon websites about how to manage the, the species. Um, but there is a lot of information online available. You just have to be discriminating about what you, uh, what you read. Um, most uh, co cooperative extension offices also cover this, this subject material because it is a problem that many people are sharing. Okay, very good. Uh, we had a question from Emily. She's talking about Japanese knotweed and that it seems to be in a category all of its own. Is there evidence that it goes to seed here? And could you talk about best concentration of which herbicide has shown to be effective? So my understanding with Japanese knotweed is that the triclopyr selective herbicides don't work on it at all. You're pretty much limited in that case to glyphosate. Fortunately, glyphosate can be is available in wetland approved formulations because Japanese knotweed usually grows along wet areas. I think it does uh, set seed in our area, although broken bits of the of the roots washing downstream is probably the primary way in which it spreads. Um, so as far as controlling it, everything I've read suggests that um, cutting it in June letting it re-sprout and spraying what re-sprouts with a glyphosate mixture, and then the following year doing it again. Um, you cut it first because you really don't wanna be spraying something seven to 10 feet tall. Um, and that, but the cutting alone does not really weaken it that much. Uh, it's really, you, you just have to be following up with a glyphosate herbicide. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we had a question from Vera. She said, thank you for your great presentation. Any advice for Japanese honeysuckle? I have thick patches on ground and wondering about cutting and deep mulching to suffocate. I don't know whether you can suffocate it with deep mulching. It's a pretty tenacious plant. It is semi evergreen. So sometimes people will spray it on a warm day in midwinter when it's really the only thing that's remotely green. And that seems to work pretty well. But again, for most vines, it's a matter of cutting it off individual plants using a brush cutter or hand pruners, and then just spraying it where it is re-sprouting along the ground. Okay, thank you. Uh, we had a, a compliment. Jeffrey said, thank you for the very helpful presentation. Um, Bethany, she had a question. She said, will cutting and stump painting with herbicide work all year round? Um, I know basal bark herbicides, the manufacturers say you can do it 12 months of the year, although some months of the year are better than others. Um, typically fall, for a, for a foliar spray, late summer, fall, they say is best because that's when the plant is taking the resources down into the roots. That said, you're going to do it when you have the time to do it. And actually for us, the swallow warts, we spray in the spring before it flowers. I'll go in with the broadleaf herbicide and target individual plants. And then we'll go back a month later and hand pull any that I missed. And of course, for swallow warts, the ones that I miss are the small ones and they still flower and set seed. Um, as far as other vines, um, the water-based uh, herbicides used on a cut stump may not work as well when the plant is fully dormant. Um, the basal bark herbicides, if say I use it on autumn olive, that autumn olive may leaf out in the spring if I did a treatment over the winter or in the fall, but then it immediately drops its leaves and dies. So it may look at first like it didn't work and then it looks like it did work. Um, so I think with the cut stump, you're probably better off uh, and a, and a water-based herbicide, you're probably better off during the growing season. Um, summer into fall, probably best. Okay, thank you. Uh, we had a question from Joanna. She says, for painting individual stems, do I need the non-ionic surfactant to mix with glyphosate? I don't think you do. Um, I don't think it would hurt either, but that's really for a foliar spray to sort of break down the cuticle and get it into the plant through the leaves. Okay, very good. We had a question from Brandon. He said, for mile a minute weed, would cutting often be enough if herbicides were trying to be avoided? Yeah, so mile a minute is an annual. And so it's gonna have less root reserves than any of these perennials that we covered today. And so weed whipping um, it probably will resprout, but not as vigorously. And if you can get to it a couple of times during the season with the weed whip um, or cutting, um, then that probably will do it. Um, we, we do, you know, if you're walking by one and you can't resist, you just pull it or cut it, you know, um, and, and that, that does work. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we had a question from Lorna. She said, I am curious whether this drier summer caused the mile a minute to die. It doesn't seem to have been as bad this year, and I found many dead vines in August. I couldn't, I couldn't hear you, um, the species that you mentioned. I was a mile a minute. Oh, mile a minute. Yeah, so there is a, a biological control that has been released for mile a minute, and that does make it less vigorous uh, than it might be otherwise. Um, and the internodal length of growth is shorter, and the season at which it sets seed is shorter as a result. And so, yes, I mean, it's still a problem, but maybe not as much of a problem as it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this person was asking specifically about this summer and how it was really dry. Do you think that that had any, any impacts on the growth of mile a minute? It might have, but I'm not really sure. Some, yeah, some years it really seems to go to town and some years it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what projects are you currently working on to mechanically remove and paint at your site at Crow's Nest? Well, this is the season where we address uh, bittersweet because with fall color, it stands out very prominently. And so we can go in and just um, cut it either 
with a tool, with a power tool, or even by hand, because a lot of errors are ones that have been treated before and are just re-sprouting and are much smaller. And so we can just go back and cut it again. And if we can go back and cut it and then paint it with herbicide, then that will be less likely to be a problem for us in the future. Okay, very good. Uh, we had a question from Karen. Is there a particular time of year that is best to apply herbicide on kudzu? If you're going with a foliar spray, I would think during the growing season, midsummer into fall, uh, when when the plants are physiologically pulling nutrients back into their roots, and that will take the herbicide with it. Okay. We had a question from Christine. We have a lot of grapevine that appears to be taking on an invasive habit in our urban forested parks. Do you have any recommendations for control? So grapevine includes many native species, but particularly near the edge of the forest or in a um, hedgerow or in a, an urban setting, an individual grapevine can become a problem. And so we will cut it, um, cut it high, cut it low. Um, and if, if it really has to be stopped, then you could do an herbicide treatment on, on the re-sprouts. We don't usually bother with the herbicide treatment on that. We just, if, if a particular plant's being a problem, we'll just cut it and, and let it go at that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a, a question from Emily. She said, I've been removing Japanese barberry from woodlands on my property using cut stump method. If the plant has already set seed, is burning the branches that are bearing seed in a fire pit enough to destroy them? I do not know the answer as to whether the seed would remain viable after fire, uh, but I would think just collecting it in a fire pit uh, itself would get it out of the landscape and might be effective enough. Depends, I guess, with what, what you do with the ashes from the fire too. That's true. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, we had a question from Hillary. She's saying, um, knotweed cutting and spraying. Does the glyphosate become inert? Wondering about spraying and then following up next year with grazing, will that be safe for animals? Um, the label would address uh, a, a, the interval for grazing. So I'd have to look specifically on the label for that. But usually I think that that grazing is allowed in a fairly short amount of time after an application of glyphosate. Um, I have no idea how effective grazing is on that particular plant. It would have to be something that the grazers would prefer to eat. Um, but uh, you, you will have re-sprouts of it in the following year. So either you're gonna treat it again or you're gonna find some other method to address it. So I would say check the, check the label for, for when, it, when it's suitable to be grazed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we had a question from Katie. She said, any special, special recommendations for English ivy? Uh, English ivy is a particularly difficult one um, for herbicides because the leaves are so thick and waxy and herbicides have a, a problem penetrating the cuticle. Um, I, again, I would cut it off of the trees where it's growing up the trunk and everything above the cut then dies. Um, and, uh, and, so maybe that's one where you use a basal bark herbicide on individual stems, as long as those stems are not right at the tree, um, because th that one is definitely more challenging with herbicides. And as I said, I haven't tried combining the glyphosate and triclopyr, so maybe that's a formulation that would work better on English ivy than, than uh, either one alone. Okay. And I think you just answered another question that someone else had asked. They said, any suggestions for English ivy um, besides mechanical removal? So it sounds like you addressed that as well. Very good. Um, let's see. Uh, Julie asked, for applying herbicides on cut stumps, is there a specialized applicator or just paintbrushes? Well, that's a good question. Um, usually I use a small um, sprayer bottle. Um, that that is just a handheld uh, with an adjustable tip that can be a mist or a spray. But there are uh, lots of other tools available. There are squeeze bottles that have a sponge applicator at the tip. Um, and that actually works pretty well with cut stumps. It works less well with foliage because the foliage just bends out of the way rather than, than being treated with the, the, the chemical. 
Um, there are uh, various laboratory um, devices uh, with the curved neck, the hooked neck, uh, where you can just squeeze it and apply. The thing to keep in mind is that it has to be a container that is suitable for chemicals, um, and it is not a food container, for example, um, and uh, that it has um, something suitable for applying it. I don't tend to do open containers with a paintbrush. Um, you certainly could, but the risk of tripping and spilling it was greater. And so I tend to use something where I can control the rate at which it comes out. Okay, good advice. Uh, and we had a comment from Joseph um, in regards to our conversation a, a minute ago about English ivy. So he said a methylated seed oil or MSO added to a foliar spray can help a lot with the thick cuticle of English ivy. Agreed, agreed. And then we had one final question uh, from Betsy. She said, I work with a friends group on habitat projects in a state park where we need someone with a pesticide applicator license to oversee herbicide projects. State parks have some staff with licenses, but they are limited, but they have limited availability. I'm curious about the potential for finding and collaborating with certified applicators at sites where they are either required by the land manager or just needed to help volunteer groups safely mix and apply herbicides. Yes, in Pennsylvania, at least, if you're applying an herbicide on someone else's property or in return for compensation, um, then you would have to have a, a pesticide applicator's license. Um, you might want to try looking at landscape companies because they would also have uh, people on staff with, with a pesticide applicator's license. The, the hard part is finding someone who is uh, understands where you're coming from. You're not looking for a manicured golf course, you're looking for something very specific management of a particular species. And that, so you'd have to sort of screen them to be sure that they're on board with what you have in mind to accomplish. Right, agreed. That was the last question that we had. We had other compliments come in. So everyone really uh, appreciated uh, all the great info that you presented on Dan. So thank you on behalf of myself and everyone that attended. Um, and we are right at um, pretty much our stopping point. So I think we'll We'll wrap it up. And Dan, as you mentioned, if folks have any questions um, after today's training, they can reach out to you with the contact info that you have here. Um, so thank you again and uh, take care, everybody. Have a wonderful day. I'll be sending out the recording uh, a little bit later so folks have access to that. Um, and yeah, take care and thanks again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay.